great that you could make it because this is sort of a short notice thing. I'm really pleased to welcome my friend Lise Marie Vanderwatt here from Stockholm. Um, Lise Marie and I have known each other for a few years mm -hmm. now. We worked together for a couple of years in Sweden um, on the International Study of Arctic Change and then Lise Marie went off to Umeå for a while and now she's at KTH in Stockholm. Um, her background is in the history of science in the polar regions and her PhD was about the um, history of South African research in Antarctica. And then for the last couple of years, she's had some, some funding to look at the development of scientific research and in institutions, Arctic institutions during the Cold War, including our own mm -hmm. um, home institution here, the Arctic Institute. So I'm really looking forward to hearing all mm -hmm. the gossip you have about our little institute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so this will be both about, well, this institute, but also about some other institutes. And, um, and we, started, uh, we started the project really this year, although we did do some archival research before, and so there's still a, a way to go. And it will be excellent, of course, to get feedback from the audience here and uh, some of your ideas and criticisms and pointers. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, historians of science have long recognized that institutions play central roles in the production of knowledge and in the creation and maintenance of cultures that facilitate that production. So what we do is we use a series of Arctic research institutes as windows into the changing nature of Arctic science and politics during the early Cold War. We argue that an approach focusing on institutions can reveal the shifting priorities in research agendas that, in turn, draw attention to the changing relations between state and scientists. We also argue that while political commitments at national level were undeniably important, Arctic research institutions cannot be reduced to manifestations of geopolitical circumstance. Our focus also permits comment upon the issue of professionalization in Arctic research. And this professionalization in Arctic research during the Cold War, we regard as a cultural phenomenon rather than as an index of the field's maturity. So um, I did not have a lot of slides. As I told uh, somebody, the slides would have essentially consisted of pictures of white men. Um, so I decided to scrap that, but what I do have is a slide with a lot of acronyms because I don't want to have to repeat the whole name of every institute all the time. Um, and so that's just a reference for you. Um, and some of them change names and so on, so it's just a little easier to have them up like that. The Second World War radically reshaped the institutional landscape for Arctic research around the entire circumpolar north. Some of the changes resulted directly from the need to create and operationalize knowledge of Arctic environments for warfare, as is the case of the Scott Polar Research Institute, or SPRI, at Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Some emerged on the back of the infrastructural and logistical expansion into the Arctic that came with the war. And this promised greater possibilities for northern experts to contribute to both military but also to civilian development. And I would argue that the Arctic Institute of North America was one such body. In other instances, the motiv main motivation for gaining knowledge about the Arctic environment was promoting economic use of the region for the benefit, mostly or exclusively, of the state. This was the case in the Soviet Union, where the Arctic Research Institute was the main headquarters of Arctic research. Further to the west, the Norwegian Polar Institute emerged from a predecessor that boasted significant expertise, especially in polar logistics, particularly Svalbard, uh, but also had a tarnished reputation since its leader, Adolf Hull, was a wartime collaborator with the Nazis in Norway. There's one thread that linked these bodies most strongly, and we argue that that is professionalization. Nowhere is this perhaps clearer than in Britain, where Spry had been founded in 1920 
as a suitable memorial to Captain Robert Falcon Scott. Uh, I think most of you would probably be familiar with who he was, but just shortly, he was the leader of the second party to reach the geographic South Pole of Darmanson, um, and he and his comrades died uh, on the return journey, and this um, caused some kind of national outpouring of grief um, in Britain. Um, the institute that emerged, that was based on uh, funding that was raised upon his death, um, was as much an intellectual as a cultural center. It specifically helped to inculcate values of empire and exploration in the young men it sent on expeditions, young men from Cambridge and Oxford, in addition to publishing a journal and hosting a library and an archive. For the great majority of these young men, and they were exclusively men, polar exploration was a stage through which they progressed and then went on to the civil service or other jobs in Britain. But for a small minority, most notably a person called Brian Roberts, the polar regions became an obsession and ideally it became a vocation. This became possible when the Admiralty began to substantially fund activities at Spry during the war through its naval intelligence wing. And the Navy is quite often very important in these uh, polar institutes. Well, for reasons that are obvious. James Wardy, a veteran of Sir Ernest Shackleton's famous 1914 to 1916 Antarctic expedition, became a leading figure at Spry and oversaw a program of collecting Arctic data that ranged from designing and improving equipment to providing background for military operations in Arctic spaces. By the time the war concluded, men such as Brian Roberts could glimpse a future in which the state placed a value on Arctic experts. This included the natural sciences, but also just simply an om omnivorous information gathering about human activities in the Arctic that could function as intelligence to the state. So simply put, they just gathered information without necessarily thinking ahead of how it could be useful because any information could perhaps potentially be useful for the state. The result of this was a cultural exchange at Spry in which the Institute's founding director, Frank Debenham, moved aside to be replaced by Robert's contemporary, Colin Bertram. While the tradition of sending young men on Arctic expeditions continued, Spry became increasingly aligned with the British state's desire for knowledge of what other states were doing in the polar region. For example, the linguist and geographer Terence Armstrong, who forged a career as an expert on Soviet Arctic activity, initially in a historical perspective, uh, which is what he did his PhD on, but later also from a contemporary perspective, in which he compiled a picture of Soviet activity in the Arctic from the scarce secondary material um, that reached Britain, not that much reached Britain, it wasn't as if you could just Google the information, um, and also through his own personal connections. He made quite a few personal connections with Soviet scientists. Roberts himself divided his time between Spry and the Foreign Office, the UK Foreign Office, where he was an active participant in polar policy making. Some will even go as far as calling him one of the architects of the Antarctic Treaty later. The importance of keeping an eye on the Soviet Arctic um, was, of course, not new. Even during World War I, there were significant changes afoot in the Russian North, including, for example, railroad construction and the establishment of Murmansk, which is something that countries felt they need to be aware of. In 1920, the Northern Scientific Commercial Expedition, which is a forerunner of ARI, which went through a couple of very complex changes, which I won't put you through, um, charged with investigating the marine and geological resources of the Soviet Arctic. Remember I said here it was economy that was really important. This included Svalbard um, at the time, of course, uh, Russia proclaimed all kinds of different areas as Arctic, and they were also very much involved in Svalbard, which then in 1925 was declared uh, a Norwegian territory. 
In any case, in Svalbard, there was this geologist, Rudolf Samoilovich, um, who served as the expedition's first secretary. In 1932, the Soviet government founded the chief directorate of the Northern Sea Route, or Glavsefmurbut, as an instrument of state with power equal to that of a special ministry. Glavsefmurbut activities were fully devoted to Arctic exploration and research. An Arctic professional the Commissar of Ice, Otto Schmidt, was appointed as its head. So Ari became the scientific center within Glavsefmurput, and Rudolf Samoilovich became its director. Um, he maintained this position until his arrest in 1938, after which he was executed. This was part of the Great Purges. Um, unlike Samoilovich, the deputy director of ARI, meteorologist and oceanographer Vladimir Vicent, will return to him. He survived these purges in the late 1930s and remained in his position uh, from 1930 to 1950. This was now the position as the vice director. Um, Glasef Morput, together with ARI, became a major center not only for conducting operations in the Soviet Arctic, but also for data gathering and research. In contrast to Spry, however, and this is important, ARI did not gather information on the Arctic activities of other states. Um, instead, they focused on applied polar research, notably ge geophysics, oceanography, and especially sea ice studies within the Russian Arctic or the Soviet Arctic. Nor did ARI's research agenda include studies of Arctic peoples and their activities. That was the domain of another smaller institute, and under Stalin, it was not that important at all. Um, Ari temporarily moved from Leningrad to Krasnoshek in Siberia, and I've completely that. I'm sorry for any Russian speakers here, uh, during the war, and its staff continued to, they were providing environmental data services for maritime operations. Arctic. And this fact that the staff continued providing this environmental data became really useful during the Cold War because it was proven then that this gathering of data could be useful for military purposes, even though that was not the reason they originally gathered the data. In the years prior to and immediately following the Second World War, personal international networks played an important role in shaping Western impressions of Soviet Arctic science, and indeed the Soviet Arctic in general. The three ORI leaders, Samoilovich, Smith, and Visser, were well known abroad and well connected, especially with German and Scandinavian scientists. Foreign polar scientists could visit the Soviet Union during the 1950s, even though on a limited scale, but they could, for example, visit them during the International Polar Year of 1932 to 1933. Another Soviet scientist who established Western contracts was Evgeny Hedo. He was a geophysicist who served with the ORI director as the ORI director in 1938-39, before he became head of hydrometeorological service. And he had especially good contact with allied meteorologists. And in these cases, it was often the meteorologists that had really good contact with one another because we needed all kinds of data. Um, in November 1945, he participated in discussions on the warming of the Arctic phenomenon. In 1945, I point out, also held at the, um, which was held at the Royal Geographical Society in London. Also present at this conference was the well-connected Swedish geographer, Hans Allmann who had been one of the guests invited to the Jubilee celebrations of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in June 1945. In connection with this Jubilee tour, Olman also visited R. in Leningrad. He led the Soviet Union impressed, but also quite anxious about the strength of Soviet polar research. And this is an impression, this impression of anxiety of the strength of uh, Soviet research that he shared with his fellow Jubilee uh, attendee, who, will be more familiar with, uh, who you will be more familiar with, Harold Innes, political economist and president of the Canadian Social Science Research Council. Innes expressed admiration for how the Soviet Union utilized science in developing its natural resources in the Arctic, arguing that Canada could benefit from a free exchange of scientific knowledge 
with um, the Soviet Union pertaining to the opening up of the Arctic. During these first several years of the Cold War, information about Soviet polar research and polar data almost completely dried up, mirroring a wider trend of secretiveness and information suppression during the final years of Stalin's rule. Between 1947 and 1953, institutional correspondence between Ari and its foreign counterparts essentially ceased. The lack of information exchange between the East and West made individuals like Terence Armstrong, who coupled his excellent language skills with expert knowledge about the Soviet Arctic, valuable assets to Western states, where the lack of insight into Soviet Arctic activities caused consternation. They did not know what was going on, and they wanted to. But what was the reality that Westerners could only deadly perceive? What was going on behind this curtain? The Soviet Union was indeed increasing its research and other activities in the Arctic, and its polar institutions were continuing to function. Large expeditions were sent to the Arctic, but these were kept secret, even from Soviet citizens. Some expeditions had military tasks, such as maintaining airfields for landing um, heavy military aircraft on ice, but most of them were civilian. The expeditions enhanced Soviet knowledge of the environmental phenomena in the far north and the ability to operate in the Arctic. Moscow actively concealed the Soviet military role in the Arctic. Okay. <laughs> um, so they actively concealed the involvement of the military, they kept it backstage. Because the, by doing this, they could also play up the rhetoric within these circles um, where the peaceful Soviet aims provided a foil to what they labeled an aggressive capitalist American military presence in the Arctic. So they wanted to maintain a civilian face to it. Following his 1945 visit, Allman came to view the Soviet, science, um, the Soviet Union as the most frightening sector in the post-1945 Arctic particularly for Norway, because of course they share a border, amongst other things. Oman has been closely connected before the war to Norge Svalbard or Isafs in the Circusse, NSIU, a Norwegian state body formed in 1928 to coordinate research and logistics on Svalbard. NSIU was closely associated in terms of both culture and identity with its founder, Adolf Hull, whose early geological training on what was then Sp the Spitsbergen ar archipelago blossomed into a more general belief that Norway ought to exercise sovereign control over the territory in addition to con uh, contributing to its exploration. This is now the territory of Svalbard. Under Hull's leadership, the NSIU conducted annual expeditions to Svalbard and attempted to exercise oversight of scientific activity on the archipelago. By the end of the war, war, Hull was thoroughly discredited by his collaboration, um, through his collaboration with the Nazis. The Norwegian Polar Institute was then founded in 1948 in order to project a new image of continued Norwegian influence in both polar regions under the leadership of an internationally recognized geophysical scientist, Harald Ulrik Svedrup. And Svedrup presented quite a different set of values um, than the nationalist who. Even more than Allman, he had strong connections with Soviet scientists before he left Norway for the US in 1936. He especially had good um, corresponding contact with Vladimir Wiese, the one from Ari. Um, but it would not be fair to characterize Sverdrup as a figurehead, given his personal investment in strengthening academic research within the Norwegian Polar Institute. So there was a huge um, emphasis on the fact that this research should be good science. Yet many NSIU employees remained within the new organization, so there was a continuation. And its culture as a practical organization concerned with polar logistics persisted, and that is even into today. For Allman and his contacts within the Norwegian political establishment, Possessing a strong instrument of state engagement with the polar region, both in terms of logistics and in terms of research, 
was essential in continued Norwegian and indeed Nordic, for years Nor Norway really acted for the whole of Scandinavia, presence in the Arctic at a time when the nascent superpowers seemed set to dominate. So they wanted to provide a foil for the nascent superpowers. And now I get to the, the exciting stuff about INA. Before 1939, the United States possessed no institution to match SPRI, ARI, or the NSIU. And Arctic research was largely the preserve of elite universities and to a lesser extent bodies such as the National Geographic Society. The war provided both a set of infrastructures to more easily access Arctic North America, most notably, of course, the Alaska-Canada Highway, and a presence in Greenland that began in 1941 as a temporary occupation to ward off a potential German invasion, but which continued to hold significance after 1945, given the strategically valuable position of the island for a future conflict with the Soviet Union. So with this broad palette of both possibilities and imperatives, it is perhaps unsurprising that no dominant state body charged with Arctic research emerged in the United States. In the US, the military assumed a far more direct role in executing polar activities than in either Norway or Britain. And this is partly due to the high importance placed on cold weather warfare. Um, Arctic dimensions existed within bodies such as the Army Corps to Master Corps and the Arctic Desert and Tropic Information Center, ATIC, which is also something I should have put up there because ATIC also plays a big role in providing the people that will establish and run INA. <laughs> New organizations such as the Snow, Ice and Permafrost Research Establishment, CYPRA founded in 1949, and the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory in Barrow, Alaska, which was founded in 1947, joined these set of institutes. In Canada, social scientific research in the Arctic prior to the war was mostly driven either by individual universities or explorer scientists. Government-initiated research tended to focus on the natural sciences, particularly in applied form, such as geological surveys that could lead to mineral exploitation. Military-led initiatives in Canada had neither the same resources nor reach as the American counterparts. And links across the 49th parallel, whether it be funding, research cooperation, or project design, were often crucial in scientific research in the Canadian Arctic. Building on these cross-border links between a few scientists and well-networked social entrepreneurs with an interest in scientific research in the North American Arctic, one significant institution did emerge, the Arctic Institute of North America. Unlike the other institutions that we discuss here, INA was established as a bi-national organization a private, independent institute incorporated by an Act of Parliament in Canada in 1945 and later also under the laws of New York State. Although INA did not necessarily, necessarily carry the same political weight as the other institutes, such as ARI or SPRI, it was not without influence in either scientific or government circles and exemplified a broader trend towards the institu institutionalization of Arctic science. Already early in 1943, separate and formal discussions were held in both the United States and Canada about establishing an institute focusing on Arctic research. The group's motivations diverged somewhat, reflecting the different national contexts and priorities. In the United States, discussions involved a very narrow group, mostly scientists under military contract who were interested in continued post-war scientific access to and research in the Canadian Arctic and who wanted the potential to build their careers as Arctic professionals. Several of the American scientists involved in the establishment of INA had the Arctic Desert and Tropic Information Center as their military home during the war. Geologist Larry Gold, Richard Byrd's second in command during his first Arctic Antarctic expedition, served as Attic scientific head, whereas uh, Dick Flint headed uh, Attic's Arctic section. Link Washburn, who completed his PhD under Flint's supervision, served as an intelligence officer in Attic. And it would be really interesting to visualize these connections in some kind of way. Um, 
and we'll work on that because there's very much links that you can draw. Through Gold and Ian e. Hopkins, the president of Dartmouth College, where Stephenson was based, Washburn soon heard of Canadian plans for an international Arctic Institute from the Canadian geographer Trevor Lloyd. At the time, Lloyd was based at Dartmouth and under contract to the Wartime Information Board where he was compiling a report on Soviet Arctic activities. The Canadian discussions, though, uh, differed in both the scope and specific goals envisaged for post-war Arctic research. Sovereignty over the Canadian Arctic was a concern, um, but mostly establishing a binational institute was seen as a pragmatic way to facilitate scientific research, drawing on American funding and know-how, but in a structure that was partly controlled by Canadians. The Canadian investment manager, Rally Parkin, played a key role in the setting up of civilian Arctic surveys in the 1940s, and eventually also the Arctic Institute. Well connected with Canada's elite and American philanthropic funders, such as the Rockefeller Foundation um, and the Carnegie Institute, Parkin was an institution builder who preferred working behind the scenes to create organizations that solved problems. In this case, the lack of knowledge needed to develop as well as secure and settle the Canadian North. Early discussions between Parkin and scientists such as Trevor Lloyd, the botanist Alf Erling Porchlet, and the veteran scientist explorers such as Diamond Genes and Velma Stephenson focused on two main concerns. Government and public indifference to domestic concerns in the North and a lack of knowledge about Northern resource development. Like Hans Allmann, Lloyd and Stephenson were apprehensive about the Soviet Union's perceived depth of logistical capacity and scientific knowledge about the Arctic. Indeed, Ari was presented as a source of inspiration for Aina, with an important caveat that Aina should be a private organization. And here I'm quoting from the first proposals for the Institute. Staffed by capable scientists, the Soviet Arctic Institute has carried out extensive research, the results of which are clearly evident in the vast development of the Soviet Arctic since the Institute began to function. It is here we've proposed that an institute similar in its scientific makeup to ARI, but smaller in size and organized privately, be established. Aina's mission was to develop research and gather information systematically designed to bring about the intelligent, develop and intelligent and orderly development of the North and to advance natural and social sciences about and scientific practice in the Arctic. Parkin, and this is important, was adamant that the new institution's focus should be strictly scientific to avoid political tensions and as such, its members were to participate in a private capacity. So for him, Aina being strictly scientific was a political choice. But while Parkin and his group sought independence from the government, they also wanted political goodwill and funding. And Parkin lobbied for the involvement of key government officials among a blend of industry representatives, which he wanted there for their management and fundraising expertise, military officials and scientists. This included using um, United States interests as a lever for mobilizing Canadian support. So they pointed to this quite actively. Much like Spry, Aina would facilitate um, Arctic research through grants in aid, coordination, logistic support, and library resources, including an Arctic bibliography and a program to translate articles from Russian into English. It would also come to manage military and government contract work and was largely reliant on its income from this, con this contract work for the first 20 years of its existence. Aina represented, though, something different from, a militarized, from the militarized trend in the United States Arctic research, even if it maintained increasingly close links with the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory in Point Barrow and the Office of Naval Research, ONR. And one of the first uh, chairpersons of the ONR, Moses Schlesniak, was also a director of AINA, um, of uh, one of the offices. Nor did it neatly follow the Canadian state concern for building an effective relationship with the United States over continental defense. 
Well, they pointed vigorously to ORI to demonstrate to potential funders on why INA was needed. INA's early boosters drew on SPRY for um, structuring this new institute. INA likewise profited from government contracts, often from military sources, that match the expertise of academic researchers to the needs of government. The relationship between INA's Montreal office and McGill University bore parallels between the re, uh, to that of the relationship between Spry and Cambridge. In both cases, the institute provided a means for students to access field sites through a formal structure that facilitated expeditions through financial grants, but that also created a kind of a congenial institutional culture that legitimized Arctic research as an academic pursuit. The connections between INA Spry and the Canadian state, unsurprisingly, were also apparent at the level of personnel. Many of the interwar generation that Wardy nurtured at Spry ended up on the other side of the Atlantic after 1945, including Pat Bird, uh, or Pat Baird, uh, Thomas Manning, and Graham Rowley. All were early employees of the Defence Research Board's Arctic section, in addition to being affiliated with INA, and both Baird and Rowley participated in the Canadian Army's well-publicised 1946 exercise Operation Max, o Max, Max Ox. <laughs> um, uh, nevertheless, there were important differences. The binational character of INA prevented any role analogous to Spry's vis-a-vis -vis the UK Foreign Office. Um, staff at Spry had security clearances um, by 1949, reflecting its status as an intelligence gathering center, whereas staff at INA did not. Initially, Link Washburn, who became one of the first executive directors to fill the post for a continuing time, saw it as in INA's interest to only direct projects which can be published without restriction to avoid political implications. However, by 1950, his position has changed likely because of INA's increasing dependence on government contracts in addition to a climate of international tension, leading him to propose that it would be necessary to develop INA among more national lines in order to be able to do classified work. One of INA's largest funders in the first decade and a half was the ONR, and Washburn moved to a new INA office in Washington, D.C. in 1951 in order to be closer to American research funding sources and the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council. INA needed to do navigate domestic changes in the science policy landscape of both Canada and the US, and these changes differed. Washburn identified a trend in especially Canadian government circles to want to directly supervise research in especially the lesser research parts of the Canadian Arctic. The ONR, which funded a lot of the um, activities, was more flexible in their funding arrangements, but their funding was regarded as an interim measure, the ideal being a long-term budget appropriation from government, which is something they lobbied for at the time. While the executive director position stayed in Montreal, where it was uh, established first, at this point, the point of gravity in INA seemed to have moved to Washington, with Washburn, even though he left, um, yeah, it moved the point of gravity moved to uh, America when Washburn moved there, even though Washburn himself actually moved from INA to Cyprus shortly after himself moving to the US. With Stalinism's demise and the subsequent thaw overseen by Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet Union became much more involved in international organi organizations of all kinds, including in science. The Soviet leadership revealed a new interest towards Western science and technology in the context of a so-called peaceful coexistence within both industrial and academic fields. Notably, and this played a very important role in the further development, the Soviet Union decided to join um, emerging plans for an international geophysical year, an event that ultimately claim, came to include a substantial Antarctic dimension in addition to coordinating research in the Arctic. Within the formal structure of the IGY's planning apparatus, the Soviet Union played an active role in a range of theaters, particularly in the Antarctic. But contacts between ARI and INA were sparse, as were contacts between ARI and the in, um, Norwegian Polar Institute. 
RA director Vladimir Brolov suggested, actually, that uh, there would, should be a series of Norwegian-Soviet exchanges in 1958. But the Norwegian Polar Institute felt that it could not, or perhaps should not, function as a contact point for all Norwegian Arctic research, and the proposal came to nothing. The first traceable post-Stalinist letter exchange between Spry and Ari dates only from January 1956, when Spry director Colin Bertram wrote to Vrolov ex proposing exchange visits between the two institutions. The letter also listed the names of other institutions in the Soviet Union that British scientists wanted to visit, stating that British scientists would be keen to visit any of the Soviet institutions engaged in polar research. A Soviet delegation arrived in London on April, in April 1956, consisting of the oceanologist um, Professor Alexei Treshnikov and Professor Igor Mashnikov. Treshnikov and Maximov's visit to Spry, just months before leaving for Antarctica, was more than a courtesy call. It wasn't just pleasantries. While the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was in fact set to rapidly advance its activities in the far south as well as the far north, and for them, knowledge of developments in Western polar research was very relevant. Terence Armstrong and Brian Roberts subsequently visited Ari at the end of May the same year, similarly keen to use the official connection between the institutes as a form of intelligence gathering. The report they produced upon returning to Britain confirmed the vast scale of polar research activity, along with a tendency in the Soviet Union of empire building by rival institutions that led them to have overlapping research efforts. They also noted a strong focus on practical Arctic research. Ari's main function, they reported, was to provide weather forecasts along the northern sea route for its parent organization, Glasef Morbid. Roberts and Armstrong, whose home base at Spry was increasingly concerned with Antarctic matters, noted that the far south was becoming important for practically every Soviet polar institution they visited. This dynamic soon applied to INA as well, especially as American support of INA started to outweigh Canadian support. The woefully meager activities on the Canadian side compared to the very bright future on the US side was starting to grate by the late 1950s. In Ottawa, the situation caused concerns among some officials that US research support was starting to infringe on Canadian sovereignty. The IGY provided tremendous opportunities for INA to expand, but was dominated by American funding and the American research agenda in Antarctica. INA, among other things, established and operated a biological laboratory at McMurdo Sound and went on to perform a range of other tasks, including organizing inland traverses and establishing um, the US IGY program's glaciological headquarters in Antarctica. At one point, the Antarctic work of INA weighed so much that the suggestion was even made to add Antarctic to the institution's name. The Norwegian Polar Institute also found itself increasingly drawn into Antarctica, despite a distinct lack of optimism um, and enthusiasm from Sverdrup. The Institute continued to send annual expeditions to Svalbard and continued to compile topographical maps of the Norwegian Antarctic Territory, in addition to uh, maintaining a range of infrastructure from navigation aids to cabins. Robert Mark Friedman has described how the United States at the time pressured Norway at a governmental level to maintain an active presence in Antarctica during the IGY, given the scale and extent of Soviet plans. And this led to a very much a political decision to establish the Norway station in Queen Maudland, which is what was on then called the Norwegian o Antarctic Territory um, in 1956. When Sverdrup suddenly died in 1957, his successor, Anders Urven, found himself take, having to deal with a rush of IGY expeditions to Svalbard from a range of states, including the Soviet Union. And he really liked that the Soviet Union was so interested in Svalbard because he could pressure the Norwegian Foreign Ministry for more resources because of it. So little wonder that then that the Norwegian Polar Institute divested its own Antarctic interest to South Africa in great haste at the end of 1959. 
when the imminent agreement of the Antarctic Treaty promised to make maintaining a permanent presence in Antarctica less important in terms of uh, politic in terms of the politics. They simply did not need to be there anymore because the treaty was in place. But the body that suffered m most permanent effects from the IGY and the Antarctic rush was undoubtedly spry. Vivian Fuchs, a veteran of the Falkland Islands Dependency Survey, which is the predecessor to today's British Antarctic Survey, began mobilizing support in 1953 for a crossing of the Antarctic continent that would complete the journey that Shackleton left unfinished nearly 40 years earlier. When Colin Bertram openly expressed skepticism about Fuchs's plans, he became into conflict with Spry's board of management. He was in conflict because they said that this journey would essentially be scientifically useless. Um, and they came into conflict with one of his key backers, Sir James Wardy. A disagreement over this specific expedition became a major issue, in large part because um, Spry's position as a quasi-official advisor to the British government on polar matters raised issues of collective loyalty to policy positions. This led to Bertram ultimately leaving his post as director of Spry, and he's, um, when glaciologist Gordon Robin took over from him, it symbolized a clear transition from Spry to being an academic facility, focusing on scientific research, which Robin thought would be much easier to use than to make international collaboration if they weren't so closely tied up with the British state. So the conclusions. What can we learn about the history of Arctic research in the early Cold War from the vantage point of a history of Arctic research institutions? We suggest three answers. First, by investigating the reasons why particular institu institutes were created or how existing institutions evolved, it becomes possible to see how individual states regarded Arctic research, but also how those priori priorities were negotiated with the researchers. While agreeing wholeheartedly that the role of states in post-1945 Arctic research cannot be downplayed, we reject characterizations of state priorities as rigid frames that narrowly define the possibilities for individual researchers. Second, our analysis points to the hitherto underappreciated role of Antarctic research, particularly within the context of the IGY, as a driver for institutional change even in organizations with a primarily Arctic mandate. Finally, attention to how institutions functioned as nodes in an international network can shed new light on how the connections between organizations and individuals reflected the possibilities afforded by wider political changes, but also perhaps the differing functions of ins institution within a national political economy. Here, the glimpses of the interaction between ORI and its Western counterparts are particularly instructive. Roberts and Armstrong's 1956 visit to ORI reflects the Kuruchev's thaw, so it reflects the fact that they could actually go. But a closer look at the content of their visit reveals how ORI served as a conduit through which international connections could take place without serving as a clearinghouse for the full spectrum of Soviet Arctic activities. They couldn't get access to all of the information. While the scale of these interactions strikes us as modest, they invite reflection on the separation of state and institution that INAS founders pushed so strongly and which caught up with Spry in the 1950s. We argue, basically, that Arctic research institutions were more than simply hotels housing Arctic researchers. They were organizations that faced outwards to the world in addition to inwards towards governments aware of their location with an ecology of institutions rather than just existing in isolation. Okay. Oh, before I forget, sorry, I really should also mention the funders and my two project partners, the PI, Peter Roberts and Julia Laius, um, who were responsible for some of the different archive, archival work. And so, yeah. That's really important to acknowledge them. So I think we have time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we also just want to keep talking afterwards. So I actually have a question for these people. You mentioned about the Russian institution. 
like, you know, Prolog was running that quick, and then there's still a Prolog running it. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not the same Prolog, but then also the guy that was there and then went to Ross Heidermet mm -hmm. is now, Ross Heidermet is now being run by somebody with the same name. And I'm just wondering about the extent to which those, like, I don't know if you guys find that out, but the extent to which those family connections move through running those institutions, because I can say the same, I can see the same in some of the mm -hmm. stuff that happened in Canada when the British came over, like Graham Rowley, mm -hmm. for instance, when he came over, and then the role he played in the Canadian government, and then how that trickled down to his, through his family to have their yeah. roles. Yeah. No, well, yes. Uh, the Soviet Union is a bit difficult because uh, not all the material is available yet. But what is available, definitely family and political connections play a huge role. Um, and there was this movement of people from different institutions, uh, but also something that they often themselves actively lobby for. You know, it, it's sort of a survival strategy as well being politically in the right place at the right time. and But for some, it was simply, I mean, the Stalinist purges, um, some of the people who were executed were later exonerated again, um, in the sense that they were not actually spies. And, uh, so yes, there is definitely that. And I think one of the important things that you can see from this is, um, is the role that the Soviet would play, um, even back then. I mean, or probably more so because there was not that many people involved and you had some of the institutions where you did your work and, uh, and that is really the, and you bring traditions with you from certain institutes. Um, that you can see quite clearly with the, the, the Wardis boys, as they called, that basically were trained um, under his wing and uh, brought some of those ideas to Canada. Um, these reasons, I mean, you're interested in cultural changes as well, right? Mm. Your overall arguments there. So I was wondering about two things and just whether that's part of your research design here. The one is in terms of institutional culture. So um, is there a discussion where you try and compare uh, in how far basic science and applied science is playing out differently in the institutions depending on whether there are in countries like the Soviet Union or Norway or mm -hmm. North America. And we talked about this a bit yesterday. The reason why I'm asking is that very often in the North American context, we see that there's no issue in combining the two ever no. so often. Whilst in the European context, very often it is that there is a lot more in terms of the history of, of science that very clear cut between yeah. applied and basic science. And the other one is more the for a lack of a better word, I'm maybe pop to the culture. So I'm interested because you also focus on the early Cold War. And a lot of the early Cold War is actually fought through newspapers and with population, right? So are you looking into how um, how much people actually know about these institutes and whether they actually signify something very specific? So there are countries where the Arctic or the North in whatever elusive mm -hmm. sense plays a very important role in identity politics. And then there are others where it doesn't. And so do you actually look into whether you know that's something that people talk about, that people are interested in, they're aware of? Um, yeah, so I think in terms um, of your first question, I should have written it down. This is institutional culture. Yeah, institutional culture. culture. Um, we're not looking at that as systematically okay. uh, for some of the other countries, but we all will probably look at it more systematically in terms of IMA, uh, partly because one has this uh, access to the research proposals and discussions about research proposals. It can really trace research priorities and how they work within the institution. And then also, of course, um, what we still need to do and what will be a very important role is also look at the universities where these mm -hmm. researchers were then based and that relationship. Um, and that's the same also, I think, in that in terms of that institutional culture, also for bringing in um, industry mm -hmm. uh, and how often they would be willing to work with the industry and how much is they lobbied for or sharing infrastructure, share infrastructure or share information. Um, sharing infrastructure is something that's definitely very interesting. Um, and there's some correspondence about that. I mean, it's, uh, it's looking into these more mundane parts of correspondence. Um, 
Well, in terms of the second question, which was... Oh. So, like, how visible are there in, oh, well, you know, those course, societies and what role do they play, especially um, in the early Cold War? It's important, I think, to look at that, um, because it's easy to see it from a perspective of one institute's archives, because mm -hmm. they exactly. will keep all the clippings, and they will keep all the information mm -hmm. and the radio programs, and but what is interesting in terms of that is in Aina, um, in the 1950s, they hired a peon firm, exactly. several peon mm -hmm. And so they, it was obviously important to them to try and create this image. Um, I think it's a different, the relationship between Aina and how they try to be part of popularization, that is interesting. But I think in terms of um, institutes in general and how important role play, that's a different research project. Uh, if you just look at the newspaper sort of press uh, coverage of what different institutes and different universities did, um, I think that would be a really exciting project, but uh, it's, you can write more monograph just on that, mm. um, I think. Uh, I think it's just a corrective, right? Because yeah. as you mentioned, it's easy to overemphasize the role of this institution. Yes. You just look it's at very who's what they produce. And then when you, uh, but you also see how they actively try to yeah. lobby for all this, <laughs> this public interest and uh, for films and press junkets and, and tours. Um, uh, that is not that visible. That is actually quite interesting. It's not that visible for um, the Soviet Union and for RA. And uh, in terms of the Norwegian Polar Institute, it has a different press culture in Norway in general, it has a different press um, or media culture at the time. And uh, there are other things in the uh, news. And not young. And Norway is more traditional moments and, and not so and defining itself as a bipolar region as a way in which to separate its own identity.